So today, the the topic is, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started Aikido? Oh man, that's, uh, that's a tough one. That's hardcore. Ah, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, like, there's so many different levels. I mean, technical. Technic- for me, technically, I don't. I don't think that there's anything that I wish I knew then that I know now. I've okay. Because co- most of it's experience based. You go, oh, there is this thing. Oh, Aikido is a martial art. Oh, it works that way. But you kind of already believe that. I already believed it was a martial art. I mean, I saw Fury Sensei move, and I was like, "Yep, it's a martial art." I got beat up on my second day, and I said, "Yep, it's a martial art." So, for me, it wasn't anything technical. Well, maybe there's a way to flip the question. And, and and maybe not, but let me try this out. What did you come in with an expectation of how practice was going to be, but it wasn't? Oh. It's a kind of a different hmm. way to go at the question. I mean, for me, when you think of a martial art, you think of matches, competition, things like that. Judo, karate, they have, I guess, sparring. Right. And... Aikido, there is no sparring. So when you came in, you're like, um, how how do I know if I won? Hmm. How do I know if I'm winning? That's the thing. Because in my experience, you know, like I, martial arts is not about winning and losing. But for me, as a civilian amateur, you're always like, uh, how do I win? Right. How do I win a fight? When you watch Aikido, you're like, um, they're just... Looks like dancing, you know? <laughs> right. But it looks like dancing where there's pain at the end when you throw the guy down. But sensei, I mean, I guess like the, I wanted to direct the question to both of you, but is from the teacher's perspective, do you see like what Ken's talking about in early students? Or is there something else that you see that people come in thinking it's going to be one way and it's really a different way? I think most people... The problem is, is that when they watch Aikido on the internet and they're like watching a video of a, a second doshu, third doshu, um, dojo cho, they don't see themselves as the uke. They only see themselves mm. as the nage. And so by seeing them, themselves as the nage, they're already creating the wrong perception of what training is going to be like. And then when they get thrown down, their eyes get all big and they go, I didn't think it was going to be like this. I thought I would just be throwing people down. It never occurred to me that I would have to be thrown down 50, 50% of the time. That's a that's a really interesting insight. I mean, I I I get that and I think I think it's right. I think people and I know I did like as you say like we think of ourselves as the active person and we don't realize how much activity goes into being okay. Yeah. I mean, when I started, I was completely out of shape, and I would get tired in the warm up. That was me too. I would get tired in the warm up. Then after that, I'd be like gassed out. I like tank on, and then you do the kimi practice, and then by the end, I was like, I don't know what was going on. And then when we first started, the dojo was very rough. I I, I used to call it uh, Gladiators <laughs> Arena because at uh, Men's Central Jail, which is down the street, the uh, general population, they, my buddy told me, oh yeah, we call that Gladiators Arena. And you think, yeah, that's kind of like the dojo when you first started because people did not care if it was your first day, your eighth day, or no. whatever. They didn't care if you had a broken Open arm. season. They just smashed you. Yeah. Yeah. My first time when I first started training, I what did they teach me? They taught me how to roll forward, roll backwards, tank on exercise. And I swear, I was just in that corner for one day and I could do none of those things perfectly. And after that, boom, in class. Interesting. I was like, uh, what do I do? Yeah. Like, sensei would uh, demonstrate the technique, and I would watch it four times, and I would be like, I have no idea what just happened right now. And then I would practice, and I would have to look over to the other people to see how they did it, you know, while the guy was throwing me down. So still going back to the question, all of us have been doing Aikido. The two of you have been doing Aikido for over 30 years. Yeah, he's 35 years. 35, started in 
89? Yeah. I'm 33 years. And this is my 30th year. Oh, yeah, Jeez. that's right. This is my actual 30th, 30th year. 30th year. Congratulations. Congratulations. So, well, I mean, that's that's over 90 years between the three of us of Aikido. Yeah. Which is a huge number. So, I mean, one of the things I think of when I think about stuff I wish I knew um, was uh, to be patient. Because when you when you first start, you want to make sure it's a martial art. You want to make sure it works. You want to you want to you know drink from the fountain really fast. Like I remember the first couple of years, like I tried to come to every class. Um, didn't always make it, but I tried to come every class. Um, but I think when you're starting out, if you're if you're aggressive, you don't have that sense that this is you have to pace yourself for life because you're going to be doing it forever. Well, okay, that brings up the, a good question or a good idea that what did you what do you know now that you didn't know then? What I did not know then is that martial arts, Aikido, Judo, Karate, Naginata, Kendo, Yaido, they are all lifestyles. Interesting. And that you cannot just jump in and jump out. Your martial arts skill is perishable. It's ephemeral. If you if you uh j- Take more, like Sensei said, you can take off, you can train for 10 years every day and take off six months and it won't affect your training. You I get, remember you telling me that. Wow. Yeah. That, but, the, but the thing is, it's a lifestyle. You, right. If you don't use it, you lose it. So you have to, I mean, yeah, you have to, it, it is a lifestyle. You have to train every day. You have to train every week. You have to train every month. You cannot take time yes. off because you, the, when, the moment that you need that skill, to negotiate that opponent, it, it may not be there because you haven't been training in for three months. You haven't been training in six years. I mean, I, I remember Sensei talking about that. And didn't he also say something like if you've only been training like a year, you can lose your um, skill in like a week? I, I thought he had a... He used to have this aphorism that, that was... Do you remember what it is? I don't know what it was, but I remember we had a student, young student, and when they did Aikido, it just caught on so fast. And I was thinking, this guy is going to pass me up. You know, young student, maybe like 13 or 14 or something like that, but tall. He wanted to be in adult class. And this guy caught on to the technique really quick. I was like, whoa, um, I better get on the ball. And what happened was he was advancing very, very quickly. What happened was he went on vacation for a few months. When he came back, boom, lost momentum, never recovered it. Wow. And I saw that. I was like, oh, so there you go. Like when you, sometimes when you start, you have to get the momentum. Once you get the momentum, you have to like keep it, ride the wave. Cause if you get off the surfboard, you can't, when you get back on, oh, the wave's gone. So, you know, I have a, I have a follow up question, which is, you know, given what you've just said and what your both of yours experience, how is there is there a lesson or a way to impart that to a new student that that this is a lifestyle practice? I don't no. think so. I don't think so either. They have to either want it, and if they try it and they like it, then they stay. Well, they say that the teacher must trick the student. Interesting. The teacher digs a tiger pit and waits for the student to to come to them, and then the student falls in. <laughs> And then they can't leave. Hmm. But if you told this person, hey, oh, welcome to Aikido Center of Los Angeles. Uh, you'll be here for the rest of your life. They're like, uh, Too much. Yeah, I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life. I just start, I quit. So what? when do you think, Sensei, people reach a tipping point where they realize practice is holistic? Is, is there, I mean, is there an epiphany moment? No, you just, you're, I think you're just so into it that, you know, like I saw this video of some guy talking about Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he said, my wife thinks I train four days, a w- four nights a week, but what she doesn't know is that I train at lunch every day also. <laughs> That's my boss's time. That's not her time, so I don't. it's none of her business. Wow. <laughs> but you have to think, like, that person is totally into it, yeah. right? And so the likelihood of them quitting a- abruptly is it's very low, low yeah. yeah. right? Usually, you know, people quit because they lose money, they move away. Their job is, you know, there's something problem with their job. There's something problem with their relationship. Right. So it's not necessarily that they fall out of love with Aikido yeah. or, or mo- other martial arts. It's just that you, you have to, you, you have to be lucky enough that no adverse situations or circumstances come up 
which impede your training. Yeah, it's not the art. It's usually your life that gets in the way. Kid, broken leg, new job, you know, graduate school, you know, something that gets in the way of your training. And then the worst thing a person can do is take the whole time off. If yes. all you can do is once a week or once a month, you should just Better, do yes. that. I right. think so too. Keep your toe in the water so that when you finally do come back, it's not your body's not shocked. Right. You know, or your lifestyle's not shocked. But most people yes. go, well, I'm only going to come once a month. It's 140. Forget it. That's right. that's a waste of money. But you have to say, no, that's, I'm paying this money as an investment so yes. that, so that my, I can still, my mind can still stay in, stay in the game. My heart can still stay in the game. Interesting. I, I had another thought about what I wish I knew that I kind of know now. And I'm curious, I'm really curious to get both of your take on this is that um, when you're younger and you're physically vigorous and you're training hard, um, we all make mistakes in our training. We make mistakes in the way we practice. We make mistakes in the way we treat other people. Um, but we have to kind of accept those mistakes and work, build on them. I'm just curious, like, is, is it either of your insight about um, how you try to correct at, at, a, at a very high level mistakes that students are making and encourage them that it's okay to not be perfect? I tell my students in Yaido, and even like in Aikido, like on one hand, you have to be very strict on yourself. Like it has to be right. But on the other hand, you have to be very kind with yourself and say, I made a mistake and it's fine. I'll correct it the next time. Because that's the beauty of the repetitive nature of traditional training. You don't have to get it right the first time. You're going to get it wrong 10,000 times. Then on the 10,000 and first time, oh, I feel it's working now. And then maybe it's another 5,000 times to get that same feeling. Then 2,000, then maybe 100. Then every 20 times you do the technique, oh, it's perfect. But you, what, what about this idea that in the old traditional way is that in the beginning it must be perfect so that in the end it is perfect? That, you know, you don't, if you, if you allow any type of nuance or imperfection in the beginning, it will fester and then it will destroy the technique in the end. So that way they say, must be perfect in the beginning. Maybe what they mean is like your attitude, it has to be, you have to strive for perfection. Like you're always trying to hit for center. So if you're a little bit off, you'll always hit something, mm. you know? So if you can't, if you can't hit the heart, you, you try to hit for center, you get a shoulder or you get a pancreas or something like that. So maybe that's what they mean. So your attitude is, it's got to be perfect, got to be perfect. But realistically, when you do a technique, it's not going to be perfect. Balance off, timing's off, what or what have you. And then as you get experience, that same idea of perfectionism, you keep it and your body kind of catches up to your attitude a little bit. That's that's my guess. I mean, that's my experience. Like it has to be right, it has to be correct, it has to be correct. But believe me, like when I practiced, most of the time I was doing it wrong, or there was some kind of mistake I was doing, and it just took a long time to get my hands and feet to move together, and then to use my center, and then timing, spacing, all these little boxes I had to check off. I just had to just be very patient and be. As long as I keep on practicing, I will catch on to it. But what, at what time or what level did did it, did you find that you go, oh, it's it's a certain level. The technique is a certain level of good, quote unquote good. But now now I understand this technique. Hmm. Satomi Sensei talks about that in one of his books. Oh, he does? Yeah. What, did, what did he say? Uh, he said about when he gained enlightenment or, or since he said he was enlightened or something like that. And like you go back to being this person that you were, but you have this moment, maybe it was Satomi or maybe it was Shimizu, but was one of those old sensei students that you have this one moment of enlightenment and then you kind of go back to where you were, but you're not the same person that you were, but you're not always in the state of enlightenment. Yeah. Like you get a moment of clarity, like you, you like a light bulb goes off in your head. Like, oh my God. And then after that, you go back to like being like your normal self. But yeah, you're changed. You do the technique a little bit differently. Yeah. 
your mind doesn't think the same way. It thinks similar, but you have a little bit different way. You let go of something. Yeah, you let go of something, or you gain something. So I, I another recollection in preparing for today was I think you touched on it, Sensei, which is that um, the longer you practice, um, you realize it's collaborative and people have to help each other. And I think when you realize that you have to help each other, that leads very much to the idea of a community. It's not so much that it's collaborative, is that you have to realize that you don't know everything. And then so you get really good at that, you know, Whatever stealing the technique. So like when Watanabe Shihan talks, I'm like listening and then, I, oh, and then I write that down in my phone and I'm like, and then later I go, hey man, what were you, what did you mean by that? And then right. he tells me something and I go, oh, I didn't know that. But if you think, ah, I know everything, you know, like you have to, I think when you get to a certain level, you realize, I don't know. Every, every answer should just be, I don't know. Because if you think, oh, no, no, this is the way it is, you're really touching upon this ego hubris thing where the you know, pride cometh before the fall. Right. And so like you have to be get you have to be good at not so much collaboration. Hey Ken, what do you think? As opposed to like going being open to the possibility that there's more information out there. Right. Yeah. I think what I meant and maybe collaborative is not the right word. I think what I meant was as you were saying in the beginning of the podcast that pe when people come to practice they think of themselves only as the nage. Um but I mean one of the things that both of you teach is that that as a uke, you have to be aware of the energy you bring into the practice because you're going to get that energy back. And it, there is a sense in which it's not obviously it's not dancing; it's a martial art. But there's this sense in which um, you can't just think of yourself as the active participant. Like it is, it's it's it requires two people minimum. Well, but that's by nature. The training is like that. You you come in a self-centered person that wants to destroy other people, and then you realize. Oh no, there are other people, and I really should have destroyed every person I meet. Yeah, like the Aikido training. When you come in, like you think, oh, it's just about myself. I need to learn to throw this guy down. And then I'm just attacking just until it's my turn to throw them down. But like you said, like Aikido is if I think if I think about your question, what you're trying to say is, is very collaborative, meaning we work together. Right. You really do work together to learn Aikido. So the way I attack, the way I take Ukemi has to, I have to take Ukemi in a way that I attack well, give you good training, but I also have to move my body in a way where I bring out your the energy in your movement. So I... Right. I encourage you to move correctly almost. So as a uke, on one hand, I'm trying to bash your head in. On the other hand, I'm trying to move in a way to bring out the best technique right. in you as a nage. Do you think that's only Aikido or do you think that's all martial arts? I would think technically that's all martial arts, but I'm going to say something that might be a little bit crazy. Aikido starts where all other martial arts, they they peak. Aikido continues from there. So I heard that at the highest level, other martial arts at their highest level start looking like Aikido. Yeah, that's true. So Aikido, right, where other martial arts stop, Aikido continues. So this collaborative way of training Yes, in karate and judo, you're supposed to give your partner a good practice and right. bring out bring out the best in your partner. So you're not trying to suppress them, but in a way you're trying to push them to be better. So it's a lot of give and take. Like you give a lot, but you got to like take back a lot to give him a chance to move correctly to understand the technique. Well, I mean, the thing about you know, this idea of collaboration is that some people use this idea of collaboration so that they can add in other martial arts or other techniques. Oh, oh well, you know, we're going to do uh, Aikido against a assault rifle. We're going to do Aikido versus a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. We're going to do, we're going to add ground fighting into Aikido. We're going to add archery into Aikido. And you can add all those things in. But the thing is, if you're going to make chocolate cake, 
you can't be asking yourself, well, how do we add these? How do I make chocolate cake kind of like strawberry also? Right. It's chocolate cake. Yes. Aikido is Aikido. Judo is judo. Karate is karate. Kendo is kendo. All those arts take a lifetime plus a day to learn. Right. So if I'm trying to learn kendo and Aikido at the same time, how good of a job am I doing? Well, I I think that's a great question. And I, don't, I think the answer is each person has their own path of development. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's harder for us to say as a group because when you have when you've done something for over thirty years, there's a lot of accretive effects that you don't notice them necessarily as they're taking place. But you know, with the with the perspective of ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years, you see things differently. The, do you think that uh, that the teacher needs to have a good student in order to challenge the teacher? Yes. The student pushes the teacher, so the teacher it forces the teacher to have to develop. I agree. Do you think Do you think that you were kind of that person for Sensei? I am not sure. Um, he used me for Ukemi a lot, and we would hang out. He would talk about certain things, and I'm not really sure if I was that. Pr- I don't consider myself a very good student. How so? I don't know why. Maybe. I mean, I didn't really cook for him. I cleaned for him, but I didn't really think I was that great. I was just, to me, I didn't think I was, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. I didn't think I was anything special. I didn't think I was a very good student either, but that's a, that's a, that's a podcast topic <laughs> for a different day. Of its own. But, but I mean, you, you, if he, you know, like if uh, he, you come and ask him about the, the history of the world or something, or, you know, the, the battle of 1812 and he goes, I don't know. He goes, well, I better go study. Yeah. yeah because, you, you know, like you were talking about before about that student who's coming up behind you and getting good, that forces you to get better. So by you getting close to Sensei and and he sees how good you're getting, he goes, well, I got to push myself to the next level. Right. I don't think he didn't push himself to the next level, but he felt that he can tell me things that if I was like 10 years earlier, I would have been like, I don't know what you're talking about. And now- like what kind of things? Oh, I can't even. God, there's so many little things that he would. Certain little details in a technique. So, it's kind of like once you get like if you're drawing a house, once you get like the the square for the house and the triangle for the roof, then you can start adding shutters and flowers in the garden, little details, things like that to make the house complete, rather than. You don't start with the shutters and the grass. You start with the frame, then you put the walls up, you know. So once I got my basics down, I felt that he was, I think he told, like, for for example, in Iaido, he would tell me stuff, different things. He would teach me differently than I felt he was teaching other people. In what way? Like, like, like you have, do you have one example as to how he taught you, di- how you think he taught you differently? He would, he would sometimes take me off to the side or he would give me a correction that he never gave anybody else. Like I would see someone else do something and then he would tell me, oh, don't do that. And I was like, oh, okay. Like he was a little bit harder on me. Like Do, more do you have an example of that? One thing he told me that he never said to anybody was... When you have the sword, when you return the, the sword to the scabbard, most people, when they get to the end, they just twist it. But when you return it to the scabbard, you have the bottom of the sword from here. It hinges like a door like this. I was like, oh, because before I was just turning it, like like rotating it like this way. But the sword comes, the sword comes down from... The um the shinogi. So now I do that all the time. He's never told, told and that, anyone like that. And that is like a secret because rotation is it, it creates a certain connotation in your mind, and hinging has different. Yes. And so the person who has been told rotation, they could bind the saya in the sword because they're they're turning it. But if you turn it over on its, you hinge it onto its side, then it doesn't make you want to like you know like. Twist it. Twist it, yes. So then like that's like the secret. Yeah, that's kind of, that's a very interesting thing that. Yeah, that's one example. There's a whole bunch of different, I can't even remember 
because I just put them all in my technique and I just do it. Because sometimes you say things, I go, I've never heard that before. And you go, oh, yes, I see you say it all the time. And I go, oh, I never heard that. Like, like what, for example? Like, like uh, I don't know if you, it, like, there's things that you said when you said the, sh- when the shoulders sit, the technique has entered your body. Yes. Like, I've been training as just as long as you, and I've never heard that before. But, you know, I'm not saying that since he told you that, but that's an understanding. I, I went, oh, that's totally true. Yeah, that's, yeah. Or what was the other one the other day that um, proper grip creates proper this, which creates proper cut or something? That is, he didn't say that. That's the understanding that I got from the proper grip. Because usually a teacher will go, grip correctly. Then you go, height. Then you, <laughs> then you're wondering, why? why is, I mean, of course, you should do everything correctly. But after training, you realize, that's why you have to grip correctly. Because your grip, that's a lifeline. Be- that's a lifeline between the sword and your center and your arm. If your grip is no good, you might as well just be... Your your hand just might, might as well be made of a Twix bar. <laughs> you know, you hit something and it's just going to snap off. So, like the energy has to, the energy. I don't like to use the word key, but the key, your energy flows from your center down your arms, has to go through your grip unimpeded, and your energy has to enter the sword. So your sword becomes alive. The sword becomes alive. Then they say, uh. Sword and uh, body become one. Then mm. I'm like, that's what they mean by sword and body become one. Mm. I was today years old when I realized what that means. Because a lot of times it's like just a company line, you know, sword and body one. Mm. And like, the, I don't know if I got any personal like, like tr- treatment like that. Do you think you got any? Because you Not, spent time with Sensei. I did. I spent time with Sensei, but it was, uh, when I think about it, it was one of my most vivid memories. Is I would go out to dinner with him fairly regularly after the first six or seven years. And I remember, I mean, we would go to sushi again often, sometimes once a week. And I remember him <laughs> like saying, This is the way you have to order the fish. Like, you have this kind of fish first, this next. You can have vegetables here. Put this amount of soy sauce in the dish. And I remember one time we were there, and there was this guy dressed in like cowboy outfit, and he just kept pouring the soy sauce into the dish. I mean, it was like every time he dipped it, it would overflow. And Sensei is like about to like kill the guy. And I, you know, I remember that ever since that like he was, I think, talking about something else, but using sushi as the lesson. Mm. Um, but he also spoke to me more. I think he connected with me um, at the at a philosophy level and and talking about Zen Buddhism. Like we would talk about um, the philosophy of martial arts. We talked hmm. about Zen stuff that he never talked about to me, anyways, in inside the dojo. So you were laughing. Well, why, why why were you laughing? I was laughing because he was. I think Sensei was telling me a story about eating sushi with you, and there was like Gohan Tsubu, like inside the inside the uh, sushi <laughs> yeah. thing. It's like, oh my god, he was like, so mad. He was so mad, yeah, because you're supposed to be like, there's a in Japanese, there's a correct way to right. do everything. You know, there's a form to do everything. When you learn that form, then it becomes very natural. Yeah. Then when you eat sushi, it looks very elegant. When even using your fingers, dip it a little yeah. bit and you put it in your no, hand. I think that's totally right. Yeah, I think it's totally right. I mean, balance you, in everything, and there's a because when you when both of you were talking about like learning the techniques early on and whether it had to be right or not right, Sensei imparted, I think, rather forcefully that the correct way to do something was almost everything. Like if you can if you can strive to do it the right way. Then you're on the right path. Yeah, and that's one of those weird things that I learned is that you go, oh, not every. I try to think not every battle needs to be fought. Right. So, oh, there's uh, Gohan Subu in there. Oh, I mean, Gohan Subu is the little bits of rice, rice. in the shoyu. Mm-hmm. You just go, oh, okay. And then my mother was different. My mother was no, you have to use hashi. Your hands are dirty, so use a hashi. And then mm-hmm. my mom was Japanese and lived in J- and grew up in Japan. She, but she was like, no, you have to use a hashi. Like, yeah, oh. so there's a right way. Yeah. There's a right. I think that's really key to like to strict Aikido or strict martial arts is practicing correctly. 
Yeah, practicing correctly, but knowing that if you do, even in Japanese, like in training, even if you come late, which is incorrect, there's a correct way to come in late. To be late, right. There's a correct way to be late, and there's a very wrong way to be late. You、What's the what correct、mean? way to be late? The correct way to be late is you bow quietly. You you quietly go to your dressing room. You you change quickly. You come out and you wait for the teacher to signal you in. You bow. You warm up really fast. Or do you, do you warm up? I wouldn't warm up. Well, a lot of times, if I was teaching, I would let them warm up. But after a while. After you get experience, you just bow and you just go in, right? Because you're supposed to come in. Technically, you're supposed to come in ready. ready. Right. The warm up is just、um, not ritual. It's just it's just a、um, transition time between the outside world to me and the training time where you get into the you build up your energy and your focus, and at the end of the warm up, boom, you're ready to go. Like you should already be warmed up. So you're、Before、actually right. I mean, you, we've talked about this, I think, but it, you actually mean to be ready, almost like when you're in the car, right? But you can't. How do you stretch out your hamstring when you're driving over there? But I mean, technically, today I would prefer that they warmed up. Right. I would prefer I they warmed up to、too. get hurt. Yes.、Right. But when I was student and I was late, I never warmed up, and、right. also I never warmed up before class, anyways. Because I I also had that mindset that Sensei advocated, which you must be ready at all times.、Right. And、right. the and the thing is, is that once my head hit the mat the first time, my bo- my body instantly was warmed up. It's like the weirdest thing. Like, like really, like your adrenaline pumps or something like that. Like you roll or you go back a roll, forward roll, and your head kind of touches the mat a little bit. You it instantly jolts you. it jolts you, and you're like ready、yeah. to go. Yeah, but I was. I was already stressed out before I came in, <laughs> so I believe my adrenaline was already like、Going. kind of dripping. I was like, oh, "Oh, time for practice." You change, you change quickly. You go down to bow in. You're like,、oh, "Okay, ready for anything?" You know, you're just like warming up because it's like nervous energy. Well, when I, when I was a student, we were students.、Um, people would go, "Hey, man,、uh, let's do thirty break falls before class. Let's do fifty break falls." <laughs> and I'd go, "Okay," and then they would. Or they would say, "Them, you throw me fifty times, I'm gonna throw you fifty times." And you go, "All right." Or one person said, "I want to let's get so tired, let's let's get really tired before class, so that we know what it's like to be tired to take、uh. class." And I was like, "Oh, okay." But yeah, I, but in terms of warming up today, I would prefer that people warmed up their bodies before they did they、yes. stretched, so they don't get injured and they could clear their mind. But In the old days, we I did not feel that we the need we, to do it. The need to do it. Yeah, some I,、uh, people do not warm up. Yeah, I have. A, I want to circle back on a on a question that was brought up or an answer that was brought up, which is, as both of you are talking about being late and having the right mindset, even when you're broken a rule. Um, I think Ken, you said that Aikido is like. The pinnacle of when other martial arts reach you, you reach near the end. That's kind of the beginning, or they start to look like Aikido. And I was just curious if you, you know, we could elaborate on that because to me that was like an incredible insight. That as you say that like, as people progress in other martial arts, some of the techniques start to look well, similar. Yeah, I mean, if you think about if we just take karate, right? You're kicking someone in the face, but at a certain level, that's kind of like. You can't just kick people in the face; it's too dangerous. But also, it it could hurt you. Right. So it's better that you, when they go to kick you, they run into your your foot, so to speak. Right. So you you see the difference. It's like you're kicking them in the face because they're sta- you're standing there, they're standing there, and you kick them in the face. Or as they came in, your leg came up, and then you kind of ran into their foot. Right. Right. So Aikido is kind of this thing where. You're you're trying to do less damage to yourself, so when they come at you, you're going to use timing, energy, spacing, you know, momentum, as opposed to just like smashing your fist through their face. Right. And that you go, what is isn't that the same thing? No, they run into your fist. Your fist did not run into their、Man. face. Right. But it's it's it is the same thing, but it's not. Yeah, I would say like in the other martial arts, when you're like if you watch that old um video of a.、Uh, Mifune Kyuzo, the old video where he's like an old man, he's just doing, doing around, he's doing, doing judo, judo, yeah, with all those guys. To me, it's like that looks fake. 
this right. old man and these young guys are trying to like throw at this guy. They can't. But in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, he's not letting them throw them. It's not fake. But to me, it looks. If I was just a regular civilian, I'd be like, that looks fake. You know. But how does Aikido, how does judo or karate look like Aikido at the at the highest levels? Like his his timing yeah. and spacing is so good that it almost looks fake. Mm. So in karate, like if you, at the highest level, that's why Aikido looks so fake because the timing and spacing is so precise. So it's really the, the person, Aiki, the Aiki part of Aikido. The, it's the Aiki part of Aikido. But is that the Aiki part of Aikido, the timing and the spacing? <sighs> that's Awaseru. Yeah, but but the I is the same character for Awaseru. It's the same character. So it's Ki or Awaseru, the way of matching your Ki or coordinating your Ki or whatever the translation is. There's probably like, there's there's the... There's a standard surface translation, and there's a deeper, deeper, deeper translation to a lot of these Japanese characters. So they always take a lot of people just take the surface. the surface translation, but they don't dig deep into like the more meaningful translation. So Aiki is, yeah, you're matching your energy with your opponent, but it's a lot more than just matching your uh, speed and power, which that's the that's the basic, right? Mm. Then you just match their intention, and maybe you have some incredible psychic. I think it goes almost into like ESP or psychic ability without going into like without going into bending spoons territory. Like, like so, the sen sen no sen, something like that. You're so attuned with the other person. Which it sounds is... sound like you thought it might be something different, sensei. No, no, it's that. I mean, he's making a very good point. It's that. You, it's just the manner in which you're, you're I don't know. Um, like it's so efficient. It, yeah, it's efficient. Like you're when you punch the person, it's precise. Like supposedly when you when you would punch Funkush Sensei in Shotokan Karate, that he, you could break your hand or, or break your arm with the flick of his his downward block. Yeah. Right. So it's not it's yeah. not that he's smashing. He, your arm. They said it was very, very um, small, and it was just like a flick of his wrist. And you don't know if he's just his, you know, bones are so def so strong or something like that. But like, it's not. He's he's doing the minimal amount of effort with the maximum result. Right. Yeah. That he's not just smashing his fist through your face, you know, on the ground. <clears throat> he's using the minimal amount of effort, timing, spacing, momentum. Yeah, like his defensive technique turned into an offensive technique. Right. Like Nakayama Sensei did that. Nakayama Sensei from um, Shotokan, Shotokan Karate. What's his first name? I can't remember his first name. But the guy in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Yeah, he did that to a guy. His block actually broke his arm. The guy trying to punch him, he blocked. He broke his arm. Mm. Next guy, then they say, no more. Yeah, they were challenging him or something like that. You're, when you think about, it's all the same because mm. it's just timing and spacing. Whatever happens after the, we talked about this last last podcast, whatever happens after the tachi ai, the moment of contact becomes karate, becomes judo, becomes aikido. Right. 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 So when people say, oh, aikido is a fake, aikido is not a martial art. No, we're, we're, it's all the same because after the tachi ai, that's all the same. Right. After that is what becomes karate, becomes judo, becomes kendo. Whatever you have in your hand, it becomes, oh, you have a sword, it becomes kendo. Right. Right? You have their lapel, it becomes judo. You have the spacing, you punch them in the face, it becomes karate. Right. But I mean, if you think about what did you know now, what do you know now right. that you wish, do you wish you knew when you were younger? I, don't, I can't really think of anything because everything I think about is... I don't, I don't think about technique as much anymore. Right. I used to really think about technique. But what I really think about is, how do I t teach this person? How do I get through to this person? How do I get through to that person? 
ah, oh, this person I got to kick out. What if I don't kick them out? What if I just work with them? What if I, uh, okay, what if I come early? What if I stay late? What if I, I don't think about technique. So would you say the technique, that's the easiest part of martial oh arts, gosh. actually. It is. The part you're doing. But then, I don't know, does that, is that arrogance and hubris? Like if I go, oh, like one time I was having dinner with, with this Aikido teacher after a seminar, and then he said, what was the hardest technique of the seminar? And I'm just eating dinner and I go, oh, like a fool. I say, oh, none of the techniques. And then he's like, look, gave me this like upset look. And I said, oh, because for me, it's all mental. I'm mm -hmm. just trying not to lose my temper. And then the person got all mad and stopped talking at, di at dinner. But for me, it's, I don't know, it's not a technical thing. Right. You know? But then y if you... You say that people get upset because they think that they can somehow wow you. But to me, it's just physical movement. Your arm only moves in a certain certain way, right? No one's coming up with a new way to move the arm. And so for me, it's 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 just it's not technique. It's how to teach people, how to calm myself, how not to get upset about the little things. And I have ADHD, so everything upsets me, right? I go, Ugh. so you're like it to me it's not it's not about the physical technique. Is it physical for you? It's physical, like I think about the technique in the sense of how I'm going to teach the students. But a lot of it is through training, you have to get rid of your own BS. Hmm. That's the hardest part is changing your attitude. Like for you, for sensei, it might be trying not to get mad, controlling his temper. To some people, it's controlling their temper, that's so hard. But doing the technique, doing kodagaishi, shido hanage, eating me, easy. Right. You know, for me, it's probably trying not to be a selfish person. You know, I have to think about other people or what? not be like insecure yeah. or you know, things like that. There's all kinds of things that people bring to the mat that you have to just, you know, like they say, you cut your head off, put it to the side. Right. You, you have to like leave your ego at the door. And you right. try to do that during training is very easy to do. But after you leave the dojo, you're back to like your usual messed up self, you know. Yeah. But for that one hour, you're good. For the one hour, you're like, it's like meditation. You are the person that you are trying to be for that one hour. That's true. It's like meditation, you know? Yeah. I mean, you become the Buddha. You become the Buddha. I mean, everything, like just last week, I left the dojo and there was a big festival at the park across the street. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving down the street and two people jaywalk at the curve. And this person came out of the... This person drove out of this off of one of the side streets and a little bit cut me off. And so as I went around them, these two people were jaywalking at the curve, right? And then, you know, like they got across and then the person got mad and flipped me off and then was like, you, I, I could see in the rearview mirror, the person's like taunting me and all this stuff. And then there was that part of me that goes, why don't you just pull over and waste this person? And then you go, you can't. And then the whole way home, I was just thinking about oh, you really shouldn't, you can't be this thing, you know, people look up to you, this stuff, you you, know, you write these blog posts, and you really can't, be, yeah, I really shouldn't do those things. But there was this part of me that goes, the moment. pull over and waste this person. Yeah, it's that part, I believe, is the hardest part of training is yeah. to, uh, what did I say? Like, uh, try not to be yourself. <laughs> mm. Yeah, do you not, know. do not, uh, what, what did Sensei say? Um, yeah, um, I forgot what he said. Uh since he said, uh, um, resist the temptation to be yourself. That's right. Mm -hmm. Resist the temptation to be yourself. And that's the hardest part of training. Yeah. Learning Iko Nikyo Sanko Yonkyo, that's not easy. Yeah. Timing and spacing, maybe a little bit more difficult. But to not be yourself, not, not to bring the bad part of yourself, that's very, very difficult. That's, uh, that, might, that might be the, the spiritual part of training, maybe. Well, yeah, like the, the the superhero super serum, right? They said yeah. it magnifies whatever qualities you have. If you're good, you'll be great. If you're bad, you'll be <laughs> really bad, evil and stuff like that. And maybe martial arts is a little bit like that where you have to, you know that it's there. And yeah, you could get out and just start beating this person up. Mm -hmm. But then you understand the consequences. You understand the philosophy. You understand all these things that it's just, it's more than just beating someone up, mm -hmm. right? And that- that's the hard part today is you think about what do you know now that you wish you knew? It's like some of those things you're just not um, experienced enough, mature enough, mm -hmm. old enough to understand that. Like when you're young, your parents say, well, you'll, when you get older, you'll understand better. It's true. It's true. 
I had a friend who was saying, "Yeah, martial arts are cool, but all that stuff about making you a better person—that's all BS." And I'm, then I was like, "Well, it's supposed to make you a better person, but you don't know how it makes you a better right. person. But as you train, you realize, oh yes, correct training does make you a better person, in a way." So c- could you apply that same thinking to shooting guns? I believe that you can. Because no different than Yaido or Batodo, yeah. cut sword forms. See, like the gun is a jutsu. Yeah. But the knowledge and wisdom of not just pulling it out whenever you feel threatened, that's the do. Yeah. Or the know. not shooting them in the leg instead of, you know, uh, the double tapping them. <laughs> or whatever what is it is, two in the chest, one in the head yeah, thing that yeah. they do that if you had the precision to shoot the gun out of their hand, the precision to shoot them in the shoulder. But the thing is that it's the litigation that happens afterwards. Right. But you know, if they, they say like was it seven percent of the time you miss? Right? You don't have that precision. They say seven percent of the time. Seventy percent. Oh, seventy percent, yes. And they're shooting under duress. And under duress. Under duress. Yeah. Yep, so I've, then that you have to make shooting a gun. Like that's what I was talking about with Mike. You have to make shooting a gun a dull, right? So when you pull it out, it's precision. When you shoot, it's precision. If you, you know, like the reason why there's supposed to be one, uh, one cut kills in swordsmanship is for mercy, right? It's for so mercy you're not and hacking them to death. Yeah, it's for mercy. So mercy, and if you don't take them out in one cut, they're trained to keep on coming after you. So if you cut off their hand. They'll just switch to their hand and they'll just keep on coming after you. So you have to take them out in one in one punch or one cut. So there's no way for them to keep on fight. It's kind of like the Black Knight in um the Holy Grail. They'll keep on coming back <laughs> after you, you know. Just a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound and just keep on coming after you. That's why you gotta like just do um a life threatening injury on them. Take them out. But then when you get to the higher levels, this you never draw the sword because you were able to de- defeat them without without drawing your weapon. Yeah, they they recognize that, oh, I'm not going to beat this guy and the fight never starts. But if you can de- learn to defeat them without unsheathing your sword, isn't that Aikido? That is Aikido. That's the highest form of martial arts is to, I guess, what, um, peace, through po- peace through power, <laughs> almost. <laughs> Uh, as Mike always says, peace through uh, superior firepower. Peace through superior firepower, <laughs> almost. Well, Sub- but the, the thing is that if you're, if all martial arts, you know, culminate at the same place, that's what we're talking about, right? But like, how do you tell this person who's just starting out? Right. It's day one. Hey, man, you're gonna you're gonna learn this, but you're never gonna lo- use this, and you're never gonna want to use it. And they go, but then aren't aren't I spinning my wheels and wasting my money? So right. then, what do you say? You go. You have to say just train, have fun. Do you enjoy it? Keep going. That that's something that I was thinking about, kind of struggling with. I think everything that both of you said has been, you know, pretty spot on. But is there any sense in which you enjoy Aikido? Like, do you, do you like? I dare say it, but I mean, is there ever a time in practice where it's fun, or is that just not possible for this type of martial art? I don't think of it in that sense anymore because I used to derive my from my fun from the destruction of others. <laughs> uh, if I saw a visitor with a black belt come in or a person I had, a, I, had a, I had a grudge against, and they came on, I would just go, "Yes, my turn," you know, and um, I would, you know, I, I found that to be quite fun. But again, you're fighting, the person you're really fighting is yourself. Right. And like you have to beat up every person in the world to realize the only person left to beat up is yourself. But I don't I don't necessarily derive fun from it because to me, this is my job. Right. I, I am, I'm a professional Aikido teacher. So I'm teaching someone, a group of people Aikido in a different country. I'm, I'm trying, I'm racking my brain thinking these are the best techniques to use. This is the best protocol. Right. This is the way I got to go around the room. You know, when I go to other dojos, you know, I've talked to you about this before. I'm not there to teach them. I go to Spain. I go to Mexico. I go to Cuba. I go wherever it is. I do not go there to teach them Aikido. I go there to inspire them. Right. And I'm not trying to be great or anything like that, but that's, their teachers are there to teach them. They, I'm an experienced martial artist. I'm an experienced Aikidoist. They should see me and go, wow, 
I want to be like that. Right. And then that's where they make it a lifestyle. That's where they do it for the rest of their lives. But if I just go there to show off, I call it entertainment. <laughs> entertainment. You go there yeah. and you're training them while you're entertaining them. You really just, it's its kind of masturbatory, right? right? So, I mean, it's not that I, I, I don't get fun out of it. I like people. I like talking to them. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, I'm there to work. Are, do you get, do you find it fun? I wouldn't say fun. And since he touched on this a few times, he said it's not like you're having fun, but it's this satisfaction or contentment of having worked hard to learn something and you catch on to it and no amount of money, nothing can take that knowledge or skill away from you. Like you have this intangible thing that, that a lot of people cannot do. There's a satisfaction to it, not a snobbiness, but you're like, but we, we weren't taught as students, maybe this is bad, I don't know, but we weren't taught as students to find it to be fun. No. Yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't this, you're, are you enjoying yourself? You know, if, if, if it you was were to, very serious, right? Yeah, it was, this Ardojo was very serious. If, if you said, Sensei, I'm enjoying this, like he would get mad at Yeah, he'd right? <laughs> be like, what is wrong with you? Well, no, he would say, oh, then it's, I'm not training you hard enough yeah, if you're right. enjoying it. I remember one student <laughs> that um, for some crazy reason, he always had a smile on his face, but <laughs> no. generally oh. he had a, he had a smile on his face at an inopportune time. Yes. Right. So if, if Sensei's yelling at you, he has a smile on his face and then Sensei one time, um, Saw that the person had a smile on his face and said, come up here in front of the whole class. Oh. That person came up and then Sensei just slapped him across the face. Damn. Because you're not, someone's getting dressed down. Someone's getting corrected. Somebody's getting trouble. You shouldn't have a smile on your right. face. You it's serious. rude. But this this guy did and then Sensei slapped him and he's like, yeah. whoa. Of course, after that, not, uh, none of no us were smiled. like, you're like, <laughs> Because, right, like you're not, it's not that you're not supposed to enjoy yourself. And maybe I'm not sure if Sensei's right or wrong. Is that you have Sensei's, people often ask me what Sensei's style is. And I always tell him he doesn't have a style. He like, teach, what do you mean by style, style of Aikido? You know, he, he has a, a flair. A, he always does this one thing with his hand that, every, you know, everyone does. You always yeah. just one technique. Sensei didn't really have that. But what he did have, which was his style, which is that you must be serious about what you do. Yeah. You know, and that, I mean, one, one time I, I, I always tell this story that I took Sensei to Pacific Palisades to um, appraise these swords. And we drove over there. You know, he has like this, this huge book. It's like this, it's like, you know, four or five inches thick. We get there, we get out of the car. The lady lays out all the swords and Sensei's just like looking through all the swords. And then he just quickly goes through the swords. This one's real. Here's the price. This one might be fake. Here's the price. Dud it all the way down. And then the lady goes, you're wrong. And he goes, David, go get the book out of the car. So I run and I get the book. And then Sensei opens the book and then shows her how he's right. And then she goes, hold on a second. She goes to get his paperwork. And she's like, oh my God, you're right. Hmm. This one might be fake. This one is real. This one. And the numbers were very close to what Sensei said. And then wow. I was like sitting there going, wow, wow, Sensei, this is so awesome. Oh my God, Sensei, you're awesome. And then he like he just got all mad at me, just be quiet. And you're like, oh, sorry. And then driving home, I was like, wow, Sensei, how did you know that? How did you know? And then he just looked at me all stern and mad, mad and he just said, because I study. Hmm. Maybe you should try it sometime. And then just oh. went off on me. And then he, and then I had to make a U-turn. And they <laughs> went off. How do you know how to drive? You were in the wrong direction. And I was like, oh my gosh. But yeah, he, so I mean, like I, at that moment, I was like, wow, all enthusiastic and happy that he was right. And then he just went off. On me. <laughs> it's funny. But I don't know. I mean, yeah, fun. I don't know if yeah. I ever told Sensei, I'm having fun today, Sensei. I would never tell Sensei I'm having fun because that's just an opening for a uh, Attack. For him to attack. So yeah. you don't give your opponent openings. You don't say, hey, Sensei, I'm having a great day. No. No. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, you are? Not no. anymore. You're you know? you just you walked yeah. in serious. Yeah, you walk in, you don't say anything. Height. 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 And that's you why just, we tell the students now, the only word that's supposed to come out of your mouth is height. Oh, well, and Sensei, I didn't mean to go, oh, and you don't want to, you know, and then the thing about the... Yeah, it's like the more you talk, the more you dig that hole, and the more your teacher's going to get mad at you. Yeah. So the best thing to say is hi, which is more than just saying yes. It's I understand. No more needs to be said. I get it. 
It's got to be set with the right energy and the right yeah. timing. Hi. 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 Like yeah. they say that the amount of time between the teacher saying something to you and you responding with hi is the amount of ego you have. So if the sensei goes, Bill, and then you don't answer, and sensei's waiting for you to come and up, I, and you go, I oh, this hi. guy's a ton of ego. Yeah. Yeah. We can't say it too. too you can't say it too late. You can't say it too early. It's got to be like the perfect rhythm. And that's almost like the timing of martial arts almost. Yeah. Yeah. But you've been doing Aikido for 30 years. What do you know now that you wish you knew 15 or 20 years ago, 25 years ago? It's, it's going to sound so cliche, but <laughs> I think it's true. It's a long game. Yeah, but I mean, you, you no, I'm just saying, like for myself, like just for myself, like I remember, I I really have memories when I was younger, where I wanted to eat the whole cake in one bite, and I don't think that's wrong or right. I just know that I, when I look back on myself, I'm like, not to be easier, but to say like, if you think about this as something that's going to take you know a day and for forever and a day, then. You can kind of adjust yourself, uh, because I really did. Like I, I remember, like I start, I started here when I started law school in '94, but I started Aikido in '93, and I mean, I remember the mindset that I had too was also very aggressive. Um, and I, I remember like the peak point of aggressivity was like I think first Q, and I had a very aggressive mindset. Um, but I didn't see that it would be a lifelong practice. Um, and I think I would have prepared myself a little bit differently. What, how, what would you have done differently? I, I think what I would have done is try to understand. Like, I know that like, since I didn't like to talk, like he would just show the technique and you, you try to do it. But I think what I would have done differently is um, try to develop my emotional and mental maturity um, with the same level of attention as I was applying to the techniques, um, which I didn't do. Like, I clearly didn't do that when I was younger. I was, like, kind of out of control, honestly. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe not at your guys' level, but, I mean, from my level, I was, like, I look back on it, I'm like, oh, my God, you were, like, out of control. Um, yeah, I remember I punched you in the eye one time. But. Yeah, but I mean, there was, was also this, I mean, we got into it in, in, in uh, Kokidosa, got punched in the face. But I remember another time I was practicing with a student not, not to be named who we were doing Sankyo from Shomenuchi and had him bladed and he's on the ground and he wouldn't like move. So I just hauled off and kicked him super hard in the ribs. Oh, yeah. And like, and then he looked at me and he, he got up and he was about ready to punch me. And I was like, dude, totally do it. Do it. And like, that mentality, so bad. What, what, would you, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Honestly, I am pretty much satisfied with the way I trained. Yeah. I just followed Sensei's instruction. Like in the beginning, I remember I used to try to use a lot of power upper body strength but me being like an unathletic uncoordinated person of course i kept on losing my balance hmm. since it was was say like just do the movement just do the movements so i just did the movement because you the the urge to win is very strong in martial yeah. arts like you just want to do the technique so you yeah. quote unquote win but i had to go to a place where i had to not care about dominating the opponent but trying to make the technique work as correctly as possible. So for right. a long time, even now, I don't use any strength when I do the technique. Right. I'm just doing the movement. Right. Just over the course of doing Aikido for so long, the movement just becomes, naturally becomes uh, stronger. But I already knew I was already doing the long game. So I just had to be patient. Mm. You know, so like... um movement equals energy in aikido your move your your movement is what generates the power in aikido not just stay in place and using your muscles right so i had to use i learned to use my feet a lot in the beginning it doesn't feel strong it it doesn't feel strong because you're not using your arms 
So when you use your whole body, it doesn't feel like you're generating a lot of generating power. a lot of power, but you actually are generating a lot of power. Hmm. But I had to just, I had to like drink the Kool Aid while not believing in drinking the Kool Aid. Almost like I had to have faith in the teaching. I I can't I couldn't I couldn't be like oh I'm gonna win, right? You know. What about you, Sensei? What is it? Is there anything? I mean, we're kind of like getting near the end of the podcast. I'm trying to think. If I could do anything different, I would say that I wish I had the courage to ask questions. Interesting. Mm. Because when Sensei, Sensei wanted me to do Yaido, I was mad at the Yaido, one of the Yaido teachers. <laughs> and um, I was mad at Sensei at the time. And then I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. And Sensei right. was like, you could be good at Yaido. And I was like, and I was also self-conscious of myself. And so I was like, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but if I, if I would have had the courage to ask, I would have maybe asked him like, why do you want me to do Yaido? Right. And then maybe he would have told me, man, you have, you know, fantastic body control. You would be good. Or the times when I really didn't understand, I'm not really from my mom's Japanese. My parents are Japanese, but I didn't grow up Japanese. And so right. I didn't really understand Japanese culture. And so when Sensei would do things to me, or you guys would do stuff to me, I wouldn't understand. And I would just be, I would just get mad. Right. Because I would think like, how oppressive, you know, how mean. And then I would just resist that I wish I had the courage to ask, hey, Sensei, would you, what do you mean by that? Right. Or, you know, like one of the things I've already worked through, which is that one Christmas, Sensei called all the black belts into the office. And maybe you know the answer, but since he calls all the black belts into the office and he gives everybody a Christmas gift, first he gives us all calendars and then he gives, he proceeds to give every person a Christmas gift, but me. And I'm just, remember this. I'm just standing there and then I'm like super embarrassed. Right. And then since like, okay, well see you all next year. And then I just like walked out with my calendar and then I was so for gosh, Five years, just mad about that. But then as I worked through it, I thought to myself, well, I never asked him, so I don't know if it's true. I don't know if, you know, I, uh, he he didn't give it to me because he's he's being mean to me, so I never asked him, so I don't know if that's true. Right. I did ask him, so I don't know, maybe it fell off the table. And that's why maybe I thought you knew. And he goes, oh, there's an extra gift here. I wonder who it's for. Everybody said they got a gift. Oh, maybe I miscounted. Right. You know, or I didn't say like, why did you not give me a gift? That hurt my feelings, right? And so I wish I would have had the courage to ask, but I was so upset, I was so embarrassed that I just held the grudge. So I wish students today would ask, like people say, whenever I talk to you, I think you're trying, it's a trick. And I go, it's not a trick. I'm not that type of person. Right. Right. But I wish I had the courage to ask my teacher, hey, like, what do you mean by that? Which I wish students would ask me when they when they are upset with me or they have a problem, they come to me and say, I don't understand what you mean by that. Right. What do you mean that I should be doing this? What do you mean by that? But that's the only thing is I if I had if I could do it all over again, I would do Yaido, but I would also have the courage to ask Sensei, I don't understand what you mean by that. And then so the miscommunication of me not bowing at this place, I don't get I don't understand that. It, and then they go, yeah. oh, well, that's the reason why. That's that's very tough. I never asked Sensei questions. But I wish I could because I did not understand. When Sensei was being mean to me or you guys were being mean to me, you say, hey, man, what's your problem? I mean, right. today I would, you know, I, I, I have the ability to ask. And, you know, maybe the last year of Sensei's life I had the ability to ask. Mm -hmm. But up until that time, what, 16 years, I just got on. I just persevered and took it. When I wish I would have said, like, well, why do you mean that? Right. Why did you say that mean thing to me today that I would be, I would never make anything of myself? Why did you say that? What do you mean by that? Explain that. And then maybe since he would have told me something that would have been very illuminating, appro illuminating appropriate, and then I would have went, wow, and then I could have changed. Like, yeah. I didn't know that we were supposed to come seven days a week. As, you know, like, that was the, that was the, uh, unspoken rule but i didn't know that so i was just living my life going to the river with my buddies <laughs> hanging out partying i didn't know that if you came to friday night class you had to go to dinner with sensei i was like all right see you guys later right right but like if you would have just asked, if i would have just had the courage to ask and not just run away i would maybe my life would be different today. Hmm. 
I think that's a really good place for us <laughs> to wrap up. So if you think about um, what do you know now that you wish you knew way, way back when, I don't know, we just basically that Aikido is a lifestyle. All yeah. martial arts, all traditional yeah. uh, training, it's a lifestyle. You can't just jump in. Right. You, you have to stay, in order to gain the benefit and continue to get the benefit, you have to keep on going. Right, right. So don't lose hope and don't quit. <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching or listening. And please don't forget to like this podcast. Mm -hmm.